We're on Cockle Cove Beach in the town of Chatham on the south side of Cape Cod on Nantucket Sound. I've come here to this particular beach to talk about beneficial reuse of dredged materials from navigation channels. The county of Barnstable, with the help, with the assistance of the state of Massachusetts, purchased their own um, hydraulic dredge uh, several years ago, and they dredged somewhere in the vicinity of about 29 tidal channels around Cape Cod. Uh, the dredge that the county uses is called the codfish. It's a hydraulic dredge, and every channel that they dredge that has compatible beach material, is the material, compatible beach material, is hydraulically pumped up onto a nearby eroding public beach. If a nearby eroding public beach is not available, oftentimes they'll take the dredge material to make it cost effective and hydraulically pump it up on a nearby eroding private beach. The proviso on that particular situation is oftentimes that they would require that there be an easement for the public to be able to walk on the new beach that was created by the dredged material just while the dredged material lasts in, for walking access only. We're here at Cockle Cove Beach to talk about a, a kind of an, an, innovative, an innovative project. Again, beneficial reuse of dredged material. Oftentimes the dredged material is placed, as I mentioned, on an eroding, on an eroding public beach. This beach we see behind here, here was a severely eroding beach, though it's a private beach. But the purpose of hydraulically pumping up the dredged material here from the tidal channel several miles down was a little bit uh, unique and a little bit innovative um, in the state of Massachusetts. And I've invited Ted Keon, the director of the Coastal Resource Department in here in Chatham, to discuss this unique project that I hope will take place in other communities because it's sort of a win-win situation, a benefit for both the tidal channel for this particular beach and eroding beach and the downdrift beaches. So I've invited Ted to come and say a few words about this particular project. Ted, good to Thank see you. you. Nice to be Thank here. you for coming. As Jim indicated, um, this project was a town concern. Um, the public beach, what we call Cockle Cove, and further down the coast, uh, where all that grouping of umbrellas further down are two of our primary Nantucket Sound public beaches. Um, they were being severely starved of sand um, because of the unique location of this um, beach area. We are essentially at the furthest eastern portion of a very long complex of groins and jetty systems that extend west of us. Since in this area of Nantucket Sound, most of the sand travels from the west toward the east, we are essentially at the end of the line of all these groin fields, which have interrupted the natural flow of sand feeding this area. So we have become very severely starved of sand in this area, and the area right in the foreground here was essentially eroded back to the tree line. There used to be trees and cedars out basically at the shorelines. So it was an upland area that was just eroding away. No sand was coming into the, um, the system whatsoever and it was all a net loss of material. When we developed the project, what we were trying to do was to provide essentially sand for the public beach. But when you look at the system, the best place to put that sand was actually west of the public beach, filling in this hole, so to speak, and allowing then the natural system to erode this sand and naturally nourish the downdrift beaches of Cockle Cove and Ridgevale. So that's what our design was for. Um, as we looked around trying to figure out where the, to get the sand, um, it became very obvious that one of the best you know, win-win situations would be to dredge a navigation channel that we have in the distance there where that lighthouse um, is the opening, the natural inlet to uh, Stage Harbor. And we have a navigation project there that has very good quality sand. If you will, it's actually the sand that may have in fact initially been here that has now migrated all the way down to the east. So what we did was bring the county dredge that Jim was describing into that navigation area and we mined that sand and pumped it basically 11,000 feet. It was one of the longest, it was the longest project that the county had done to date. So we dredged from this navigation project and put the sand right in this hole, filling up this, this area here. Um, we placed about 30,000 yards. Um, as, within weeks after we started pumping, we were working from the east toward the west the sand started to migrate down into Cockle Cove. It was, it was functioning basically exactly as planned. Um, what you see here is, you know, some obvious scarping of this beach. Um, in some areas, you know, that would be sort of concerning because you're losing the beach. In our case, 
it's exactly what we were expecting. Um, we put the sand here. We were fully aware it was going to be a temporary situation. We want this sand to erode and to naturally trickle down and, and in a you know more quiescent mode, renourish the public beaches down at the lower end. Um, the project is about three, three about three years old now. Um, we don't really have a time frame or target for when we want to do this again. We would ideally like to be able to renourish this area um, and allow the system to continue to work. Um, you know, the funding issues are always legitimate issues if it's a priority of the town. Um, I know the homeowners have been, that we're replaced this in, we're very happy to see this happen. Um, and I think that they would be supportive of us doing it again. Jim also indicated the strolling easements. You know, you do need that. The public um, along private shores is not afforded the right to simply walk for the purpose of walking. Um, but now along this portion of beach, they, they do do that. And it's been very popular. People love to walk up and down here. And, you know, the beach is, is functioning quite well. Um, the homes that there is this home that we're standing at, um, there is a home around the corner of the trees. They were all set to build a revetment system, sort of a, an unusual design that had never been tried in New England before. But once our project sort of came online, they decided that they didn't need to do that project, that our uh, beach and dune system would essentially provide the same benefits. So that they walked away from the project and hopefully won't need to do it. Um, I don't have, again, a, a time horizon of how long this will last. We're hoping that it would last probably another five, six, maybe even seven years. Um, as always, we're at the whims of nature and the severity of the storms that we get during that period. Um, but for now, everything is, is working quite well. And I think the town has been pleased with the results and, and hopefully our public beaches will continue to benefit as this you know, sand migrates down, you know, providing the feeder source that was the original concept. When we were at Whitecrest Hollow in Wellfleet at an earlier site visit, I mentioned the word outwash plains, defined as coastal banks in the state wetlands protection regulations. Well, we've traveled from Wellfleet on the Atlantic Ocean. We've traveled across Cape Cod from east to west. We're now in the town of East Ham. The water body to my left is Cape Cod Bay. This is the western extent of those glacial outwash plains. And one of the reasons why we know that these particular outwash plains were laid down by the South Channel ice lobe which once existed what is in what is now the Atlantic Ocean is because not only are the bluffs, the top of the bluff elevation slightly lower than what we saw at Whitecrest Hollow, but also because after storms, oftentimes in the town of East Ham and particularly in the town of, of Wellfleet in Cape Cod Bay, we see deltaic deposits in these bluffs. Now that's an indication that the sand was traveling from east to west and with deltaic deposits, that's an indication that they, do, they were deposited in a water body. And the water body that, this, that these outwash plains were deposited into was the former glacial lake Cape Cod, which I had mentioned when we were on the western extent of Cape Cod Bay over in the town of uh, Plymouth at the White Cliffs property. So these are the, this is the western extent of the glacial outwash plains. And again, the glacial outwash plains, because they were deposited by moving water, they were sorted. We saw a lot of coarse grain sediments at the, White Crest, at the White Crest Hollow area. The sediments here are a little bit finer because they've traveled a little bit further and they were sorted through a water mechanism. Basically, that glacial waters that were melting from the, from the uh, South Channel ice lobe deposited in the ocean in glacial Lake Cape Cod. So these sediments are slightly finer in, in sediment size. But again, you can see that they're a tremendous sediment source that continues to feed our beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches. Back to that same first principle, fundamental principle of coastal processes, which this is the primary sand source that continues to allow for the existence of our beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches. So these bluffs are eroding at about an average rate of approximately about one foot per year. And again, bluffs don't erode at an average rate per year. They generally will erode, for, uh, erode at a very low rate, and then a storm will take large chunks of, of material out of these properties under northeast or northwest storm conditions. Back in December of 2005, we had a significant west-northwest wind blow at about 100 miles per hour, but only, one, only, only over one tidal cycle. But that caused significant erosion of these bluffs, and of course it alarmed a number of the property owners. And in an effort to 
protect what they consider their valuable waterfront property, there were probably in the vicinity of about a dozen revetments uh, proposed and permitted, either new ones proposed and permitted or reconstruction of revetments because of the damage that was caused by that December 2005 storm. And we know what, once you wall up these sediment sources, you've taken away some volume of sand from the beach system. And that's what's one of the reasons that's causing erosion, in addition to typical storms and relative sea level rise. So in the town of East Ham, I brought you here for two reasons. One, to talk about the western extent, the coastal processes, the glacial outwash plains, but also what I would consider we are in an erosion management dilemma, not just here in Massachusetts, but I would suggest uh, around the country. And that erosion management dilemma is because in an effort to protect this valuable waterfront property, which continues contributes to the tax base of a lot of these coastal communities, once you cut off that sediment supply, you've eliminated some volume of sand for the beach, which increases the erosion. In a revetment, a riprap revetment, which we'll see um, shortly in another piece of property, we did look at a gabion revetment. It's a static coastal engineering structure. As sea level continues to rise and erosion continues, the high water line will continue to migrate landward. It will eventually catch up to a static structure, such as a revetment. And once you have that high water catch up to that coastal engineering structure, you essentially have eliminated the dry beach. So I brought you here for two reasons. One, to look at the glacial outwash plains and the sorting of the material, but also to, talk, to discuss that erosion management dilemma, management dilemma and the loss of dry beach at high tide. We're going to walk up the beach just a, a, a little bit and take a look at a revetment in forced high water at high tide. And we'll meet Henry Lind, the director of the Natural Resource Department in East Ham, when we travel just a little bit further up the beach. We've walked up the shore in East Ham, just a short distance from where we just talked about the western extent of the glacial outwash plains. I had mentioned the term erosion management dilemma that we're dealing with here in Massachusetts, and I'm sure that many other states around the country are dealing with the same issue. And what I mean by that is, what you can see in the distance is a riprap revetment. The riprap revetments are, are constructed to slow erosion, perhaps prevent it for a short period of time and protect that valuable waterfront property. But what you can see is with ongoing erosion and relative sea level rise, the high water line will eventually migrate landward and will finally hit that coastal engineering structure. Thus, we have no dry beach left at high tide. I really don't know any community in Massachusetts that doesn't have some linear length of beach, a dry beach, lost at high tide due to armoring. And it's no wonder that people want to protect their valuable water from property, but this is one of the management dilemmas that we need, need to deal with today. In the town of East Ham, they have established a, a pretty innovative um, and, and interesting mitigative measure to try and slow the loss of these dry beaches. And I've invited uh, Henry Lind, the director of the Natural Resource Department in East Ham, to join us to explain a little bit about the revetments and so forth, the history in this town. Thank you for coming, Henry. Good to see you. You're welcome. Thank you. As Jim pointed out, this is Campground Beach, and it is one of the town-owned public access areas. It is subject to this combination of the dilemma of erosion and the protection of property rights by uh, individual homeowners. The town's responsibility is to achieve a balance between the protection of these properties that you see behind me and the resulting revetments, armoring, and uh, securing of the, the dwellings with the needs of the beachgoers who are enjoying a pleasant day here, but who are faced with receding beach areas and uh, surfaces on which to sit and enjoy the area. One of the techniques that our Conservation Commission has used is to attempt to stabilize that balance through artificial nourishment of areas that are required for uh, revetment construction and to delay as long as possible the installation of an engineered structure uh, with the emphasis on soft so-called solutions and working with nature rather than uh, directly trying to combat the forces of erosion. We've traveled a couple of miles south along the Cape Cod Bay shore of East Ham from Camp Crown Beach to now to Thumpertown Beach. I've talked extensively about the erosion of our coastal bluffs, coastal banks, uh, being the primary source of sand that allows for the existence of our beach and dunes and barrier beaches. So with the erosion of these bluffs through storms and sea level rise, 
the homeowners want to protect their valuable upland property and that's, that's reasonable from their perspective. But if you were to armor these bluffs with a riprap revetment, with a door or bag revetment, or some type of coastal engineering structure, you're removing some volume of sand that would have otherwise fed the beach and the downdrift dunes and barrier beaches. There are several ways of replacing that sand, which makes sense. If you're removing sand from a system, causing increased erosion, affecting other people's properties or natural resources, I think it's our responsibility to think of techniques where we can replace some of that lost sand, some of the compatible beach sand, and there are a variety of ways of doing that. One, you can conduct a beach nourishment project. You could use beneficial reuse of dredge material from, uh, from tidal channels and navigation channels, but what about when you have a coastal engineering structure on a coastal bluff? Well, several towns, particularly on Cape Cod, have come up with a, an innovative balance of trying to replace some volume of sand that's lost from these coastal bluffs. And in the town of East Ham, in my observations and my experience, is probably one of the more progressive towns in requiring a mitigative technique of bringing the lost sand that would have otherwise eroded from these bluffs and returning it back to the beach. And again, I've invited Henry Lynn, the director of the Natural Resource Department, to describe this innovative technique that the town of East Ham and others on Cape Cod are requiring as a result of a condition on building coastal engineering structures to slow the erosion of these coastal bluffs to protect their valuable waterfront property. So. Henry? When a property owner applies to the Conservation Commission for a project to stabilize the coastal bank in front of their properties, we encourage the use of a uh, passive uh, system. Initially, uh, you can see in the pic in the behind me a very, very sturdy drift fence. And this is a variant on the theme of sand snow fencing that has been used uh, historically to capture windblown sand. This, however, is made out of two by fours and fairly stable posts and is constructed in a zigzag fashion. And it's been in the five or six years that we've been using it, found to be very effective at trapping a great deal of wind-blown sand and allowing that to be used sacrificially when the first part of the storm tide uh, arrives. In those cases where a coastal engineered structure uh, is the only last resort, the Conservation Commission calculates the amount of sand that would have eroded from the coastal bank in the event that that structure were not there. And that is a function of the width of the property, the average annual rate of erosion, and the height of the bank. And the calculation is made and made as a part of the order of conditions that annually that sand shall be placed on the bank by the property owner in whatever artificial means is appropriate. The sand that you're seeing on this coastal bank, therefore, has all, all been brought in from outside sources. The hope is that during the storm events, that sand will be available for the wave action to redistribute on the beach. In the case of an extreme event, the commission requires an extra 10% of that calculated volume to be placed at or near the high water mark for use during that rare event when those storm tides will need extra sand available. The result is a fairly wide and healthy beach in front of a coastal engineered structure. We're in the White Crips Condominium Country Club in the southern part of Plymouth on the south shore of Massachusetts now. Uh, to the north of us, you can see the eroding bluffs. Those are glacial outwash plains. To the north of the outwash plains is Ellisville State Harbor, State Park, and to the north of that is Center Hill Point. The water body in front of us is Cape Cod Bay. To the south, you can see the jetties to the Cape Cod Canal, and just southeast of the Cape Cod Canal is the northern part of Cape Cod itself. Back about 21,000 years ago, this entire area was covered with glacial ice. It's been estimated that the glacier was approximately a mile thick. 21,000 years ago, the, the glacier reached its southern extent and that was the island of Martha's Vineyard and the island of Nantucket. By about 18,000 years ago, the glacier had melted back to the approximate location of the northern area that we see here of Cape Cod. By about 15,000 years ago, this area that we see in front of us was free of ice. 
As the glacier melted back, the water in the ice started to fill this basin. There was a marine deposit that was <coughs> established along the northern part of Cape Cod, and that's where Route 6 was built on top of that marine deposit. As the glacier continued to melt back, the enormous volumes of water that were melting out of that glacier were captured, actually dammed up by the Cape Cod Bay Moraine deposit. So this water body that we see in front of us, that is now a marine <coughs> water body called Cape Cod Bay, was once Glacial Lake Cape Cod because it was trapped by that damming effect of the Cape Cod <coughs> Bay Moraine. The water of the Cape Cod Bay Glacial Lake was approximately 65 feet higher than we presently see the, le presently see the level of Cape Cod Bay itself. These glacial outwash plains that we see to the north, which we'll be, we'll be visiting uh, shortly, sometimes you can see deltaic deposits. And that's an indication that, that those glacial outwash plains were laid down by the Buzzards Bay ice lobe. Remember, we had three major ice lobes. The <coughs> South Channel lobe, the Cape Cod Bay ice lobe, which occupied this area here, and the Buzzards Bay ice lobe. And as it melted, <coughs> the cascading sands that, came, that were washed out, basically washed out, of the marine deposit as the glacier was melted created these beautiful 140 to 155 foot uh, coastal bluffs, what we call coastal banks in the wetlands protection regulations. We're going to go up and take a look at these glacial outwash deposits, talk a little bit about their depositional hi history and how to identify a glacial outwash deposit and also talk about some erosion control alternatives that some of the homeowners are attempting uh, at the base of these um, outwash plains or coastal banks as we call them in the coastal wetlands protection regulations. We're on the beach now at the, at the toe of these 140-foot high glacial outwash plains. These cliff deposits were deposited by the Buzzards Bay ice lobe in a series of braided streams. Because they were deposited directly by glacial action, they're called coastal banks in the state wetlands protection regulations. A coastal bank under the wetland, state wetlands regulations is defined as an elevated landform other than a coastal dune that lies at the landward edge of a coastal beach, a coastal dune, or other wetlands. You can see that these, deposited, these deposits that make up this glacial marine deposit are primarily coarse and fine-grained materials, primarily cobble, pebble, and sand deposits. The silt and clays were cascaded into Glacial Lake Cape Cod and are now part of the substrate making up the benthic habitat of Cape Cod Bay, of Cape Cod Bay that was once Glacial Lake Cape Cod. And these sandy deposits now are the glacial outwash plains. These are one of the most important sediment sources for beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches in Massachusetts. As the east-northeast storms cascade across Cape Cod Bay, you'll inundate the toe of the bluff, toe of the coastal bank. And as they inundate the toe of the coastal bank, there'll be slump deposits. That beautiful sandy material will then feed these beaches. Again, it's one of the most important sediment sources for beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches in Massachusetts. And that's one of the first fundamental principles of coastal processes in Massachusetts, is that the glacial landforms that are eroding due to storms and sea level rise are the primary source of sediment that, allow, that created and allows for the continued existence of our beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches in Massachusetts. If it were not for the erosion and the sediment input from the, these glacial uplands, we would not have beaches, dunes, or barrier beaches in Massachusetts. And landward of the barrier beaches are the bays and the estuaries, the tidal flats and the marine organisms that live in these bays would not exist if it were not for the erosion of these glacial uplands. So the importance of this source material is critical. Now as, if, as this material erodes from the beach, it doesn't necessarily remain on the beach in front of these glacial bluffs. Through wind-generated currents called longshore currents, the sediment is picked up by storm waves and it's carried down drift in the opposite direction the wind and the waves are coming from. As an example, if I took a ball and I bounced it off the face of this glacial bluff at an angle, it would, the ball would go in the opposite direction that I was throwing in it from. And that's the same thing, same mechanism that transports sand, pebble, and under severe storm conditions, cobble as it feeds the downdrift beaches all the way past the Cape Cod Canal jetties to the town of Sandwich and the town of Barnstable, which we'll be visiting a little bit later in the day. There are constraints about doing certain activities on coastal bluffs dealing with erosion control structures. And I'd like to go up and visit this erosion control structure that you see in the distance here. 
which is called a gabion revetment. We'll talk a little bit about this gabion revetment and about some of the constraints under the state wetlands protection regulations on erosion control structures in Massachusetts. I had mentioned that these glacial outwash plains are defined as coastal banks in the state wetlands protection regulations. A very important consideration in constructing erosion control structures on coastal banks in Massachusetts is what's known as the grandfathering clause. Because of the importance of the sediment that erodes from these coastal bluffs to this beach, as well as all beaches down drift of this particular deposit, all the way 15 miles down to Barnesville and Cape Cod, because of the importance of that material in feeding our beaches and maintaining the health and integrity of the beaches, there's a clause in the regulations that states that you cannot build a coastal engineering structure on the toe of a coastal bank to protect a building that was built after August 10th of 1978. That was the promulgation date of the state coastal wetlands protection regulations. And the reason for that clause, that prohibition on coastal engineering structures to prevent erosion of these coastal bluffs is because the scientists wrote a report for the legislature back in the mid 1970s describing the importance of the sand eroding from these coastal bluffs. Again, without the sand eroding from these coastal banks, we wouldn't have the dune beaches and barrier beaches and all the biological organisms that exist landward of barrier beaches without the erosion of these glacial bluffs. So we've recognized the importance of erosion of these bluffs. And therefore, if your house was built prior to August 10th, 1978, you can be considered for some type of structural armoring to help protect your variable waterfront upland property. What we see here in the background is what we call a gabion revetment. It's basically a wire basket generally PVC coated wire basket that's filled with trap rock. And the trap rock was anywhere from four to eight inches generally to keep it in the trap in the gabion baskets and from washing out. The gabion revetment here is, is approximately nine to 14 rows, rows high and it's built into the beach, two or three rows, to accommodate for storm, scour, and for the loss of beach during the winter uh, seasonal cycle. There is a condition on this gabion revetment that it be covered with sand to compensate for the loss of material that will now happen as a result of this engineering structure. A number of the communities on the South Shore, and particularly on Cape Cod, which we'll be visiting shortly, a lot of the coastal communities now, recognizing the importance of the loss of this material, are requiring that coastal engineering structures, such as the gabion revetment we see behind us, is covered with a commensable volume of sediment, primarily sand, that would have otherwise come out of the bluff. So that when the storm comes, that it, then it can pick up this material, much like nature would have done naturally, erode the material, put it on the beach, and allow it to cascade down drift onto other people's properties to protect other people's properties, as well as all the coastal resources from here all the way down to the end of this particular littoral cell. We're just a little ways down the beach now from the Gabion revetment that we just talked about. We're still looking at the glacial outwash plains in the Cedarville area of Plymouth, just south of the White Cliffs Country Club. If you look at these coastal bluffs, they're obviously, again, outwash plains made of fine and coarse grain materials, sands, pebble, and in some cases, cobble. Because of the exposure of Cape Cod Bay to storms, these bluffs are eroding at an average rate of about a foot to two per year. Now, coastal banks and coastal bluffs don't erode on average rates per year. It's just the way that geologists describe them. Oftentimes what you'll have is some fine grain lenses, lenses in the bluff that would get saturated and you'll end up with the bluffs slumping at the top and losing the top of the bank anywhere from, from two to four, maybe five or six feet during any single storm. And as you can see, the homes on top of here are, are boarded up, they're on cribbings now. They're pretty much at the end of, the end of their um, property existence because of the coastal erosion and the storm exposure that we have here. Many of the houses along this area of the bluffs have been relocated one, two, some of them three times over the last several decades so that the property owners can enjoy their waterfront property as long as possible. Further down on the bluff here, there's another Gabion revetment. We're maybe 100 yards or so north of the Gabion revetment that was just finished this year that we just discussed. This Gabion revetment here is the identical design to the one that was just completed that we just looked at. This was built in the early 1990s. So this Gabion revetment here on this open ocean shore subject to wave activity, I would suggest has a life expectancy of somewhere in the vicinity of 15 years based on the performance of this revetment itself, this Gabion revetment itself. But you can see it did, it did stabilize the bluff. Vegetation did take a hold. You can see that on either end of the properties, it's completely unvegetated because it had protected the toe of the bluff. 
That's the most important consideration when you're thinking, thinking about erosion control on coastal banks or coastal bluffs, is to protecting the toe of the bluff. By protecting the toe of the bluff, they did extend the life of their property and they're enjoying their property for a little bit longer. The gabion revetment that we just looked at will probably have a similar life expectancy of anywhere from 10, maybe 15 years, if we have the same, same storm climate that has occurred over the past couple of decades. We're on the beach in southern Plymouth, in the White Cliffs area of southern Plymouth, Cape Cod Bay to my right. In the distance, we can see the Cape Cod Canal still in Cape Cod. We had just discussed one of the many varieties of shore parallel erosion control structures. We previously discussed the Gabion revetment. We'll be talking more about shore parallel erosion control structures as we continue our tour of Massachusetts. What I wanted to discuss here was shore perpendicular erosion control structures. What we see in the distance here is riprap. This is what's known as a riprap groin. It's basically made of boulders. It's made uh, perpendicular to the shoreline. A coastal groin is constructed primarily to create a beach on the updrift side of the groin. I talked about the first fundamental principle of coastal processes, which is the primary source of sand, pebble, and cobble that feeds our beaches comes from the erosion of glacial uplands. I talked about the second fundamental coastal processes principle, which was once the material, the sediment erodes from our glacial uplands, it's transported along the beach in the opposite direction of the waves in the longshore sediment transport system. So a groin is generally built on the downdrift side of a property, primarily to trap sand in the longshore sediment transport process to build an updrift beach. And as you can see, this coastal groin here is relatively successful. There's a much higher elevation of the beach on the updrift side, on the side we're on, as opposed to the downdrift side of the groin, which is just south of that groin. You can see the individuals on the south side of the groin. You can notice that the elevation is much lower. And that's because the sand that's eroding from the updrift bluffs is trans being transported along the beach by longshore currents and being trapped by this riprap groin, creating a beautiful wide sandy beach on the updrift side. The adverse impact of a coastal groin, of course, is that it prevents sand from going on the downdrift side of, of the beach. So oftentimes, groins are still allowed under state wetlands protection regulations. They are discouraged in most cases because of the adverse impact on the downdrift side. But the requirement, if you are permitted to build a groin, is that you keep the updrift fillet, the updrift section of the groin, filled to entrapment capacity. In other words, you have to fill the entire compartment up here with beach compatible sand to allow that sand to continue moving in the longshore sediment transport system to the downdrift beach. It's required to be kept to entrapment capacity at all times. We've traveled several miles north from Whitecrest Hollow in Wellfleet along the Cape Cod National Seashore. We're now on a landform called High Head in the town of Truro. At one time when the <coughs> glaciers were continuing to melt, that last continental glaciation that had this entire area covered in a mile high ice sheet, about 20 thousand years ago to 18,000 years ago. As the glacier melted, the water that was in the glacier began to enter into the ocean and the sea level began to rise. And at that time, none of the landforms that you see in the distance here existed. In fact, this was part of the Atlantic Ocean. There's a wave cut terrace at the base of, high, uh, of this particular landform, High Head and Truro here, where waves lapped at this particular landform. As you look at the, in the distance, all of the land that you see in front of you, including the province, province lands dunes, all of Provincetown that you see in the distance is all sand that eroded from the Cape Cod National Seashore Bluffs and was transported north by longshore currents. Remember that longshore sediment transport system? I had mentioned when we were at Whitecrest Hollow that the Cape Cod National Seashore in several particular locations extended approximately three miles seaward than they presently exist. Well, much of that sand was transported north and now has created the province lands dunes in all of Provincetown. Some of the sand has actually been transported south as a result of that divergence in that longshore transport current. So some of it was transported south, formed the beaches south of Whitecrest Hollow in the towns of Orleans and East Ham and Chatham, forming Nosset, the Great Beach, Nosset Beach, as well as Monomoy Island and the shoals that exist south of, uh, of uh, Monomoy Island. But this is the importance of that longshore sediment transport process, at least the un 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 uninterrupted longshore sediment transport. If you, again, were to either wall up the sediment sources of the national seashore or build groins or jetties to harbors and so forth, it would interrupt that longshore sediment transport, prevent the sand from transporting north, and you would probably see an increased erosion rate 
of the province lands and province down if you were to wall up that sediment source. Again, the importance of one sediment sources and an uninterrupted longshore sediment transport supply. So now we see the beauty of these lands, again, created by these natural processes, wave-induced erosions of our, of our glacial uplands, our coastal banks, and that longshore sediment transport process. The erosion of the National Seashore Bluffs is approximately two and a half to maybe three and a half feet per year, at least over the last 150 years, of which we, have, we and the federal government have mapped the shoreline changes along that national seashore. So as long as that erosion rate continues, we'll have that beautiful longshore sediment transport volumes, and we'll continue to see accretion rates along the province lands and the province town uh, center. This water body that you see in front of you here is called Pilgrim Lake. It was once called East Harbor. It was actually a hydraulic connection between the Atlantic Ocean and what was formerly known as East Harbor. But as a result of man's activities, particularly the formation of a dike, a railroad that once transported tourists up to Provincetown, and now you see the major road, Route 6, which connects uh, connects us to, uh, to Provincetown. As a result of man's activities, we've closed up the inlet to East Harbor, and now it's become basically a brackish lake uh, called Pilgrim Lake. Back when this was a wave-cut terrace, this was actually, in the historical literature, one of the, the first places that the pilgrims landed and drank their first fresh water on the North American continent at the base of this particular bluff. As a result of the loss of the hydraulic connection, the old entrance channel to East Harbor, because of the closing due to the road construction and railroad construction, the water body that you see in front of you, now called Pilgrim Lake, has pretty much become eutrophic. A lot of the biological resources that once existed had died off, and there were serious water quality problems. However, recently, Cape Cod National Seashore, the towns of Truro and Provincetown, and, and others, uh, have initiated a substantial effort to sort of reestablish the aquatic resources that once existed in here, and they have made a new hydraulic connection to Pilgrim Lake. And just in recent years, they've seen a lot of the biological organisms returning, shellfish, so a lot of the, uh, some of the salt marsh grasses are returning, a lot of small fish are returning back in here, simply because of the reestablishment of the hydraulic connection with Cape Cod Bay to Pilgrim Lake. So we can reverse the adverse effects that human beings have done to our coastline in a very short period of time simply by reestablishing the hydraulic connections and allowing some marine waters to come in. So nature will take care of itself if we could help reestablish some of these hydraulic connections to a lot of our water bodies that we have choked off in the past before we knew better. We're on Long Beach in the Centerville area in the town of Barnstable on Cape Cod. The water body adjacent to the beach is Centerville Harbor, and that's adjacent to Nantucket Sound. Long Beach is a barrier beach. As a barrier beach, it consists of a coastal beach and a coastal dune, and the Centerville River is landward of this barrier beach. As you can see, it's a relatively low-lying beach, and a very low-lying dune, and as such, during storms, and particularly hurricanes, these homes are in in jeopardy of particularly storm-induced erosion because of the low volume and the low-lying coastal dunes. Under the State Wetlands Protection Regulations, the limits, the options for protecting properties are relatively limited. As I had mentioned, the coastal dune section and the barrier beach sections of the Wetlands Protection Regulations prohibit coastal engineering structures in coastal dunes and on barrier beaches. So the options for homeowners on barrier beaches and coastal dunes are primarily either dune restoration or beach nourishment. With sea level continuing to rise and predicted to accelerate in its rise to about two feet every 100 years and potentially more intense storms in the future, these property owners have those two options, dune restoration or beach nourishment. Beach nourishment has not been conducted in Massachusetts on any large scale. South of Massachusetts and the state of New Jersey and southward, it's a very common practice because they have the sand resources available nearby, primarily in their tidal inlets in the flood of ebb tidal deltas. Beach nourishment is basically bringing sand, compatible beach sand from an off-site source, either from a sand and gravel quarry or from the offshore area. But it must be compatible sand and hydraulically pumping it up or trucking it into an area and widening the beach berm to help dissipate storm wave energy. Beach nourishment has been conducted very rarely on Cape Cod. However, there were three 
engineered and designed beach nourishment projects conducted over the last decade or so on the south side of Cape Cod. Long Beach was one of those projects where beach nourishment has taken place and has met its design expectations. I've invited Leslie Fields from the Woods Hole Group to come and describe the Long Beach Nourishment Project here, one of three that the Woods Hole Group has designed over the years. So thank you for joining us, Leslie, and happy to see you. Glad to be here. The Woods Hole Group was originally contacted back in 1985 by the Long Beach Homeowners Association, which is a group of about 30 or 40 property owners, private property owners, along this stretch of shoreline. The Homeowners Association was concerned with erosion of the beach. At the time that they contacted the Woods Hole Group, the erosion had proceeded to the extent that the mean high water shoreline was immediately at the toe or in front of these seawalls right here and on further down the beach. Um, that means that those structures, which were designed to be the last line of defense, were being subjected to forces that they were not designed for. So the homeowners were concerned not only with the integrity of those structures, but also with protection of their homes and their properties and the associated infrastructure. They were also concerned, of course, with the loss of the recreational um, beach. So the Woods Hole Group came in and designed a beach nourishment project for this stretch of shoreline. We constructed that project in the winter of 1989 and 1990. We placed about 100,000 cubic yards of sand along this stretch of shoreline over about 3,000 feet of beach. In the process, we were able to push the mean high water shoreline from the toe of the structure, the toe of these revetments and seawalls, we're able to push that mean high water line seaward by about 100 feet. Now beyond that, out below the water, of course, the fill extended another, say, 50 to 60 feet. So it gave this beach area in these homes a significant measure of storm damage protection and flood control. The material for the beach nourishment project was obtained from an offshore borrow site located seaward of the entrance to East Bay over in this direction here. We were able to use a hydraulic cutter head dredge for that part of the project to pump the material up and build the beach. After that project, part of the project was completed, we planted beach grass along the upper edge of the sand and that was what facilitated the formation of the dunes that you see here. Now we designed the project to have approximately a 10 year lifespan. We monitored the beach and its performance annually. After 10 years in 1989, we found that we had more than 30% of the sand left in the original project area. So at that point, we decided to come back and re-nurse the project a second time. In the winter of 1989 or 1999 and 2000, we re-nursed the project over a slightly shorter length of shoreline, over 2,100 feet. We used 60,000 cubic yards of sand to do that project, and again extended the water line seaward by 100 feet. So right now in 2006, we're about six years out from the last project, and we have anywhere from 60 to 75 feet of shoreline left at high water. In our estimation, as well as the homeowners, the project has been a, a big success and provided recreational beach and a significant measure of storm damage protection and flood control. We're in the Spring Hill Beach area in the town of Sandwich on Cape Cod now, and I brought you here so we could discuss issues on barrier beaches. Now, a barrier beach in the state of Massachusetts is defined as consisting of a beach and a dune, and on the landward side, there's either a salt marsh or a water body. That water body could be a fresh water or could be salt water. In this particular case, we have a salt marsh on the landward side of this particular barrier beach here at Spring Hill. You can see there's an unimproved road here made of hard, hard compact material, and this road is inundated during moon tides in some areas and almost completely inundated during storms. This is a relatively hazard prone area. It consists of really of one large dune and it is a velocity zone. Again, defined as a coastal floodplain that can support greater than a three foot wave under 100 year storm conditions. We're going to, going to go on on the front side of the barrier beach and talk about uh, issues relating to coastal beach and coastal dune construction, particularly relating to the barrier beaches here in Spring Hill Beach. 
Well, we just showed you the landward side of Spring Hill Beach in the town of Sandwich. As I had mentioned, it's a barrier beach consisting of a beach and a dune with a wetland on the back side of the barrier beach. This demonstrates one of, the, one of the fundamental principles of coastal processes in Massachusetts, which is longshore sediment transport or the littoral drift. Now, I had mentioned the first principle, the primary source of sand, pebble, and cobble that allows for the existence of our beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches comes from the erosion of our glacial uplands, our glacial landforms. If we look in the distance, farther across Cape Cod Bay, we can see the coastal banks that we just came from that are in southern Plymouth. That's the White Cliffs Cedarville area that we just visited. The sediment that's eroding from those coastal banks is actually transported in a south-southeast direction and actually ends up on this beach eventually sometime later. So the second fundamental principle of a longshore sediment transport or littoral drift comes into play here. Much of the sand that we see here has actually originated some from the near shore area, but a lot of it from the coastal bluffs, the coastal banks that we see in the distance. So we have a barrier beach here. This is one of the one of 681 barrier beaches we have in Massachusetts. This happens to be one of a densely developed barrier beaches. We also have a series of undeveloped barrier beaches called coastal barrier resource units. We have 96 of those. Those are undeveloped barrier beaches designated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife where no federal flood insurance or any type of federal expenditures are allowed unless they're consistent with preserving the natural environment. But here you can see we have a densely developed barrier beach. The barrier beach as you can see from the aerial photograph, consists really of only one single large dune. Now under the National Flood Insurance Program definition of a velocity zone in a coastal area since the late 1980s is that a velocity zone reaches landward on a primary funnel dune to the landward toe of the dune. So this area automatically qualifies for a velocity zone under the National Flood Insurance Program, meaning that any structure, new structure or structure that is substantially rebuilt must be built on open pilings based under the state building code, the National Flood Insurance Program requirements, and under the state wetlands protection regulations. They need to be on open pilings without breakaway walls. The erosion rate along this particular beach here is, if you look at the long-term average over the past 150 years, it's about a half a foot per year erosion rate. But what we've noted in the data are that particularly since about the 1950s, which was when we see, saw a lot of coastal armoring take place to preserve the upland property, we've noticed that the erosion rate has significantly accelerated along this beach and along the stretch further to the east to about between a foot to a foot and a half per year on average. So this area here is susceptible to storm damage, not only short-term storm damage erosion, but long-term chronic erosion at a rate of about a foot and a half per year. The last major storm we had was the October 90, 1991 no, no, no name or Halloween Northeaster as it's being known, known. And as you can see from the slide that we're inserting here, many of these houses were substantially damaged. Many of them were destroyed. If you look at the dune at this piece of property here with the American flag waving, you can still see the remnants of the October 1991 storm. You can see a dune scarp. Due to the extensive damage that many of these houses uh, sustained during that October 91 storm and the subsequent December 1992 storm, the Army Corps of Engineers with federal funding, particularly from FEMA, came in and rebuilt one of five sacrificial dunes to cover, basically cover up that, that uh, dune scarp. They put approximately 40,000 cubic yards of sand in front of the dune in order for the homeowners in the town to sit, to stand back and take a look at their property and decide what type of mitigative measures that they could conduct to help eliminate or at least reduce subsequent damage from coastal storms in the future. On a coastal dune under the state wetlands protection regulations, for the most part you can't armor a coastal dune and that is because although it doesn't explicitly state you cannot armor a coastal dune, the regulation performance standards state that you must allow a dune to erode again to provide its sediment to the fronting beach and to the, into the adjacent properties to help preserve the environment and protect, uh, preserve, prevent or reduce storm damage to adjacent properties. You've got to allow the dune to migrate both landward and laterally under wave and storm conditions. So you really can't structurally armor a coastal dune. So that leaves you with really two mitigative alternatives. One is a dune restoration project, meaning bringing in sand from an outside source to recreate the dune scarp, or perhaps a beach nourishment project which would have widened the dune and break up wave energy and help protect the landward properties. 
We're going to visit a property just so shortly down, uh, down the beach here where a, a dune restoration project has taken place. So we'll talk about the dune restoration project that occurred, occurred in the 1990s by bringing in sand from an off-site source, compatible beach and dune sand, and then planting it with native vegetation. So we'll take a do, look at a, a dune restoration project, much like we saw after those major storms in the early 1990s. We're a little bit farther east, still on Spring Hill Beach in the town of Sandwich on Cape Cod, or on Cape Cod Bay. Um, I brought you to this property because I noticed a, a, what looks like a successful dune restoration project. You can see that there's a nice dune slope with native, uh, native vegetation, American beach grass that was construct constructed in front of this property to try and help prevent storm damage, basically protecting this valuable waterfront property. You can see the property uh, to the west adjacent to this particular piece of property where a dune restoration has not taken place, perhaps yet. You can still see there's a dune scarp there, basically that vertical elevation in front of the dune where sand has not brought in. Um, if we have a storm this winter, we'll more than likely see this property here protected much more so than adjacent properties where they haven't conducted the dune restoration. Dune restoration or beach nourishment are two of the primary alternative, mitigative alternatives available to waterfront property owners in Massachusetts under the state wetlands protection regulations. As I had mentioned, under the state wetlands protection regulations for coastal dunes, Basically, coastal engineering structures are prohibited because the performance standards require that you must allow a dune to erode and provide its sand not only to the fronting beach during erosion, but to the downdrift beaches. And if the updrift property owners have not armored their dune, then the entire soon sand volume will move along the shore, keep the volume of the beach high, and will help dissipate storm wave energy and hopefully preserve or protect some of these waterfront properties. The other alternative is beach nourishment, which we'll talk about a little bit later in our tour. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting George Wall, the uh, waterfront property owner here, several days ago, and we talked about his dune restoration project. Basically, what you're required to do in dune restoration is to bring in dune or beach compatible sand, recreate the dune slope, and then plant native vegetation, perhaps American beach grass, maybe some bayberry or rosa ragosa, basically as a sacrificial sand deposit to be removed during storms, to enter the longshore transport system, but hopefully for, for, for provide some degree of protection to this landward area. So I've asked uh, homeowner George Wall to join us today to sort of talk about some preservation uh, activities that he has taken on his particular piece of property, elevating the house on open pilings in the dune, and to talk a little bit about the dune restoration project and really um, his experience living here in Spring Hill Beach, uh, this lovely Spring Hill Beach, both in the winter and summer seasons. So I've asked uh, Mr. Wall to join us. Thank Hi, you, thank you for you? joining us, George. Good, it's good to see you. I was asked to comment on the uh, condition and the status of our dune here. Uh, we rebuilt the house three years ago, and two of the requirements by, that were made by the uh, building people in Sandwich was that we had to put the house on pilings, and we had to remove the riprap that had been on the beach since 1957. Uh, we were not very happy about having to renew, remove the riprap because we thought it had helped to uh, maintain uh, our beach and the dune. Uh, but nevertheless, we had to remove it, which we did. We uh, put, built this dune, or actually a dune before this one, we built the dune uh, as a part of the construction of the house and uh, a set of stairs like these stairs and the first winter that we were here, uh, the dune completely washed away so that it was a straight drop from the deck to the beach, the level that we're standing on, and the stairs were torn away. Uh, we, we rebuilt the, the dune and replanted the grass and uh, put a new set of stairs on, hopefully uh, that that will stay uh, for the foreseeable future. It, uh, I have to say that it weathered well during this past winter uh, and the, the stairs basically stayed the same and the, and the dune did also. How long Mother Nature is going to be like that, I have no idea, but uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed to uh, avoid having to rebuild the whole thing again. We'll 
Looking at these concrete stairs here, they're adjacent to Mr. Wall's property where we just discussed the dune restoration project. These concrete stairs have been here uh, since the 1930s. And you can see that it's, the stairs come down to about the toe of the dune. This is suggesting that this is a very uh, migratory um, coastal dune, which when a coastal dune erodes, the sand moves along the shore to other people's properties. But following a major storm, the winds will pick up the finer grain sands, the wind-blown sands, and oftentimes will rebuild the foredune scarp. Um, if it doesn't rebuild the foredune scarp, like after those major storms in the, up, in the early 1990s, um, homeowners or the government will come in and, and rebuild the dune scarp in a, in a, as a sacrificial dune, and then the homeowners will replant it. But the point being that, that if these stairs have been here since the 1930s, and you can see that they're about at the toe of the dune, that this is a very um, migratory shoreline. It will erode during storms, but storms, after following the storms, and the sand usually sits offshore, the storm bars will generally migrate landward due to a change in the wave shape. Once those sand bars migrate and attach themselves onto the beach, the winds will pick up the wind, the smaller grain sands, blow them back up to the dune and rebuild, and rebuild the four dune scarp. Uh, Mr. Wall did move his, his uh, new house back about 10 feet from where the former cottage um, 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 existed, which does suggest that there is, a, there is um, still about a foot per year erosion rate here, but it's a very transient erosion rate, more than likely seasonally dominated rather than long term.